much family together, there's going to be a lot of chatter. That is a fact, though. It's great to hear. Um, you know, there is a time after 11.30 you can still get together, and it runs to next week <laughs> at 9.30 in the morning. So, um, it's good to see everybody here. And it's good to see Lloyd here. Jim. We've got ladies sitting over here. On the cold. The matriarch of a family who came in from Martinsburg, no. Waynesburg, Washington. Washington, Pennsylvania. And she's got a husband, brother in law, and a son that are out doing work right now. They just came down because they want to help. That's cool. Um, and they're not discriminatory who they help. If somebody needs help, they're about it. They've got equipment, and they're just doing it. Um, well, it, to me, it's amazing because of the folks that uh, Jason and Devin were here last week. They went home. Cole show up the next day. Well, that's the vibe. Say, they got all the way home without a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's this is a miracle in itself. Uh, I want to commend this church family for the work that you're putting in, uh, helping. People in Western North Carolina. Some we know, some we don't. Uh, just yesterday, we had hundreds of people form this building uh, for a few hours for supplies, for clothing. It's a beautiful thing to see. For uh, some of them, just take it, yes. That's okay. That's okay. We'll get used eventually. It's not doing us any good right there. So, get out of here. And then, Folks went up to the Mimkin's house and did a thing which I remember about the flooding. They brought out sheetrock and they did mucking. They got them cleaned up. They had to start rebuilding on their life. That's a great thing. And there's many more things going on that will affect you. Uh, so, with that being said, I'll give you some things to do in the coming week if you want. Uh, we still have a warehouse full of clothes. No dangerous, of course. Um, 
uh, we need to get out, get sorted out, and get out to the community. Because uh, their generosity is goes so long, but you can't expect it to go on forever. So this Tuesday, from 2 to 7, 2 to 7, we're going to do clothes sorting here at the building with dinner thrown in. So, uh, by the way, one of the fifth people on Saturday is going to be us on Tuesday. So, time to do that if you can. 2 to 7. After lunch, before dinner, you can sort. Then on Thursday, from uh, noon till 4. Anytime you can make that happen. It's just it's going through and saying, this is good, this is bad, this is in. So, uh, it doesn't, doesn't take expertise. I would do it a lot faster than some people would, but um, it's good. Yes. Picture. We're trying to, to make a car, a thank you car, from Bill Rogers Christ to send out to the thousands of people that we know that have sent us gifts or bought supplies. We need your pictures to be sent to Sunday Tech. It's in the bulletin. If you'll look. We've got good pictures. I really love pictures that have people. But the idea is that hey, we want to show people that what they did and what they trusted us is worth it. We want to thank them for it, but we also want to commend them, show them that we're stepping up and what they did. So kind of a twofold. Uh, also, there is bulletins, so I'm not going to read the bulletin to you. One thing out of it, I will, well, two things actually. Trunk or treat on Wednesday. Yeah. Wednesday evening here in the parking lot, we're going to participate in that. Trunk or treat. Catch Jason for good details at the church. And then next Sunday, you get the best treat the government could possibly do an extra hour sleep. All right? <laughs> so. Nobody has any excuse for not showing up next week. You're doing such a problem. There's also the assignment sheet. Please give that a look. If there's anything um, that you can't make that you're assigned to, please let someone know. Do so I have any other announcements while I do it? Many of you remember Lexi Klein, they were the Smiths, put her here back on her feet, a little straight, moved back, but she was close to one of the toes. She would eat. And right now she's at Mayo Clinic, I have to take care of her. And they believe that she is going to Jason is heading up there later today. Request of the family. If you will, we will start service. Take a minute. people in our past. Don't always understand why they are. Give it Smith down. Just church down. Anything you need us Please join.
join me in standing to sing our first two songs this morning? Let's unfold our hearts in joyful praise in the triumph song. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Our sun will work for thee, for thee, opening to the sun.
yesterday. Sing this song now. We will honor our Redeemer who always lives in our feet. You know the, uh, the words of the song, I know that my Redeemer lives. <laughs> I know that my Redeemer lives as ever prays for me. I know who eternal life he is from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he is. I know. Saving grace. 
spoke to multitudes about how to have a blessed life. They marveled at God's words, followed in his remote areas to do the Lord's teaching. How many of those were there when he had false accusations made? He was condemned to die. He fed thousands, more than that. They ate their fill and were satisfied. They wanted to make him a king. Wouldn't those have been enough all for his release and those who cried out for Barabbas? He healed so many that they crushed men around him in homes and in open. Places. They declared that they were no longer blind, lame, or unclean. Some of them even described what it was like to come back to be clean. Was there no one there to put them to this easy conclusion? He entered Jerusalem amidst shouts of praise and joy. On Friday, he Yet people will ask, why is it that you take communion every Sunday? I assume you should. But things change after Jesus is resurrected. Ask those who, knowing him, and knowing that they had denied him, but somehow claim him. Ask those who demanded to see holes in his body. If the significance of the flesh and the blood of Jesus ever got tiresome or complicated. Those who went out to tell the story of Jesus were never rewarded with super wealth, superstar status, or even positions of So how is it that they endured years of deprivation and the seeming necessities of life for him or someone else to choose? Because they remember how it is that they have the Lord and Savior. So what we do this morning, again, Death, burial, resurrection. That Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. Pray with me. Father, this symbol of the body of your Son is so dear to us. It does remind us, it does call us, it does inspire us to be your children. And we have that opportunity only because of the sacrifice that that flesh went through. And we're so grateful to be called to this place time and time again. We are no different in our makeup than the people who are in the world except for the fact that we have been shown love and we recognize it. And we celebrate it as we remember this this morning. Thank you for blessing us. In Jesus, amen.
If you are covered by the blood of Jesus, you look perfect this morning. Inside of your heart. Let's thank him for that. Father, this cup that we're about to drink, we know represented torment and agony for your son. And how it could be changed into joyous celebration is truly a miracle. And we remember both. We are changed forever. We are yours because you have given us a remedy for sin. Help us to recall that this morning. Help us to live that today and this week. We praise you again in the name of Jesus. Amen. Over the years, I've most commonly thought that we are the Gentile church reaching out to the Jerusalem church to help them, whether it be through missionary funds or disaster relief. But now we're the Jerusalem church in a time of famine. It's a wonderful thing to be loved from afar. We're grateful. We have gifts to bring. We have talents to bring. We have love to share. Let's ask God's blessing on all of us. Father, we are grateful for the many hands and faces that we'll never know personally in this life. But we thank you that you are the one who has compelled them to see our need and to respond. And so the gifts and the hands that we bring to you this morning, 
we dedicate to you as you have given us everything that you could possibly give us. Help us to respond in the way of love. Bless those who distribute these gifts, who seek wisdom on how best to use them, and help the message go out. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is love. Come down from you. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'll be reading from the book of Acts, chapter 20, verses 31 through 35. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit to you, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This being the last Sunday of the month, we do not have children's church for knowledge seekers. And uh, as we sing this song today, and in the context of what we recently experienced or witnessed, we'll have um, increased means. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. 
this morning we are going to get back to our series in 2 Corinthians. Uh, before the storm happened, we had done two lessons on that, and we made it through chapter 7. And that entire first section, chapters 1 through 7, is addressing a conflict that had occurred between Paul and the church at Corinth. Paul had been treated not very good. Uh, there were some people in the church who had turned their back on him. They decided they wanted to follow other preachers who were a bit more flashy. People who had more money and better reputations, who weren't always in trouble, and they were just better speakers than Paul. They decided we don't want Paul anymore. And so now Paul is making his defense to the church at Corinth. But it's really sad because he's saying I shouldn't have to. I shouldn't have to defend myself to you guys. I started the church here. You know me. You know my works. You know everything I've done. And the fact that I have to explain myself all over again is kind of messed up. And you can really sum up the first seven chapters as church hurt. Paul is the one who's been hurt. Even so, he is trying to make amends. He's not turning his back on the church. He's not giving up on them. Instead, he says he loves them, he takes joy in them, he has comfort in them. Even though there have been some fights, he's working for their benefit. Well, Paul is going to come back to that subject again, but here in chapters 8 and 9, he shifts gears. He has to address a totally different topic, and it's the topic of forgotten generosity. Jerusalem was in the middle of a famine. And the church there was suffering. And so Paul and some of the others were working to rally all the churches together to take up a collection and to provide some relief for them. That should sound familiar. There are churches all over the country that have been doing that exact same thing for us. For them, at this time, it doesn't move quite as fast. They can't just wire money. They don't have an app where they can send it. They can't just send a check and know that that check's going to show up in a couple days. It doesn't work that way. They're coordinating a collection from different churches, and they've been doing it for a very long while. And we can go all the way back to Paul's first letter to Corinth and see the background for it. In chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. And so every first day of the week, they're putting something aside, they're collecting, they're saving up, and when Paul comes, they're going to take all of that, and they're going to send some messengers to Jerusalem and deliver this gift. It's not just Corinth who's doing it. As he says there in verse 1, he told the Galatians to do the same thing. In 2 Corinthians, we find there's other churches that are doing the same thing, so this is a big, coordinated effort. But then, conflict happens. Suddenly, there's a rift between Paul and Corinth. And this idea of taking a collection and sending it to Jerusalem kind of got put on the back. The project got shelved because they weren't real sure what was going to happen between them and the people involved in all of this. But Paul uses this part of his letter to say, hey, that whole thing's still happening. We're still doing that. And it would be great if you guys could go ahead and fulfill what you've already promised. In 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 6, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For so they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, 
They gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. Why is this so important? What's it matter if they're giving money to help others in need? Well, the whole thing really hinges then on verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. If you are trying to be like Christ, this is the example. Christ exemplifies love, humility, and generosity. And if we're going to be Christians, followers of Christ, then we need to exemplify love, humility, and generosity. Christ was rich. He was in heaven. He came to earth. He came poor. He gave himself up for us. And our job is to do the same thing. If we are truly transformed by Christ, and that's the example we have, and that's the sort of person we're trying to be. And Paul mentions the church at Macedonia. They were poor themselves. They had no real ability to help others because they needed help themselves, but they followed the example of Christ so well that even in their poverty, they were still giving up what they had help others. Paul brags on them and says, this is how you do it. This is who you should be. In verses 10 through 11, and in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire it. So now finish doing it as well. So that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you you started it. You desired it. You wanted to be a part of it. So now, finish it. How often do we start things that we never finish? How often do we have great ideas or things that we want to be a part of or noble goals that we want to achieve that we just don't follow through? How many of you actually do and stick to all of your New Year's resolutions. Not finishing what we started can happen. And here in this situation, we have the added problem of interpersonal conflict. Well, we were going to do it. Paul's involved. We don't really want our money going anywhere that it is. It would be like some other church saying, you know, hurricane came through and we really want to help build more Church of Christ. We want to send them some relief money. We want to do a good work there, but Andy's the elder over finance. We don't like that guy. We're not going to do it. We'd love to help him out, but Michael's the preacher and he's not very good. He's kind of a jerk. We're not going to do it. Conflict. There's a good work to be done, but because of the conflict, you say, no, that's bigger, so we're not going to do it. When people come to Christ, there's usually an excitement. There's a zeal. There's a fervor that's attached to it. I'm going to follow Him so well. I'm going to read my Bible so much. I'm going to love others. Start Bible studies. I'm going to teach people. I'm going to spread the gospel. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And life comes along. Things happen. Frustration. There's conflict, there's problems. We let that get in the way. Stop us from all those great things we were going to do. Things happen, and now we're not quite as committed as we once were. Titus has been working with the Corinthians as well. And Paul says in verses 16 through 21, <coughs> excuse me, the thanks be to God, he put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care I have for you. For he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he is going to you of his own accord. With him we are sending the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. Not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself. 
and to show our goodwill. We take this course so that no one should blame us about this generous gift that is being administered by us. For we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of men. There's been some debate about this passage. Paul mentions the brother who is famous among the churches for his preaching of the gospel. We don't know exactly who that is. There's some speculation. Maybe this was Apollos. Maybe Luke. Could be Timothy. Tons of names are given as possible. In the end, we don't know. We have no idea. And it's interesting that Paul doesn't actually name him by name. Instead, he just calls him the brother who is famous. Well, what's the current issue with the Corinthians? They love the famous people. They love the showy ones. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. The problem is you care more about the fact that they're famous than whether they're good or bad. But Paul is being very pragmatic right now. He's protecting himself. There are some in the church who don't like him. They would love to accuse him of wrongdoing. So Paul says, when we take the collection and deliver it, other people are going with us too. People you know, people you like. This isn't just me. He says in verse 20, we take this course so that no one should blame us about this generous gift that is being administered to us. If you want to accuse me of wrongdoing, well, Titus was there. Some of the people from your own congregation were there. And hey, that famous preacher you guys really love, he was there. Don't blame me for anything. I'm sure you're all familiar with the saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Unfortunately, that's true. We can have the best intentions and the purest motives. Somebody will say otherwise. Somebody is going to accuse us of wrong. Paul wants to cover his bases and say this is a generous gift. This is helping the brothers and sisters in Christ, and there's nothing more to it than that, and there's no way you can say that there is. This is for God's glory. This is to show the example of Christ, and I want to make sure that's all anyone can ever say about it. In chapter 9, he says that he's been bragging about Corinth. He's been telling other churches all about them and how they're doing this and how great it really is. And now other churches are excited about it, but he's going to send some people ahead just to make sure everything's ready. Verse 5, so I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised, so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. Once again, Paul is being careful. He's covering his bases. He doesn't want to show up at Corinth and say, where's the money? It wouldn't look good. He wants to make sure that this is really a gift it doesn't look like he's just showing up and making you pay. This has to be because you want to do it. Not because I'm making you do it. Verses 6 and 7, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Everyone must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves cheerfully. This is a passage we've all heard a million times. And what's interesting about it is how true it is, not just from a religious standpoint. Pretty much all of the super rich, super successful people out there, they'll tell you they start their budget giving. That's the first thing. How much of this am I giving away to help people? And then, what do I have left over? Warren Buffett, you've all heard of him, worth billions. He was known for being very stingy. He didn't drive fancy cars. He didn't insist on a lavish lifestyle. He was known for eating hamburgers at McDonald's. And he would not order the cheeseburger because he thought it was ridiculous. You had to pay 20 cents extra for that piece of cheese. Not going to do it. He lived very frugally. His wife was the same. There was a story about how she went to a camp that 
was millionaires only. And she complained because they only had the fancy coffee that you had to pay $4 for. And I'm not going to do that. Yet, they gave away billions. Gave tons of his money away. Not going to pay 20 cents for that cheese, but I'll give you a million, a billion. Most of the super wealthy people in this world are the same way because they've learned that if you want to reap bountifully, it starts by sowing. You have to actually use the money you have. You have to have the attitude that money is not to be hoarded. It's not a commodity that you got to hang on to with a tight fist. Instead, use it to make a difference. And that is the kind of attitude that God wants us as Christians to have. He doesn't want you being generous because you have to, because I told you so. He wants you being generous because you have an attitude of generosity. I want to help. I want to do good. I want to use my resources. You do it cheerfully because that's what you want to do. And back in chapter 8, when Paul was talking about the churches in Macedonia, he said they had an abundance of joy and extreme poverty, which overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. That's the sort of character God wants. That's the attitude that Christians should have, whether we're rich or poor or anywhere in between. We need to be characterized by our generosity, our willingness to help in whatever ways we can. And even though we often benefit personally from our generosity, that's not the point of it. It's for the glory of God. It's showing that we are being used by Him to benefit others, show Christ, and to live Christ. 13 through 15, by their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from the confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Big deal. What's going to happen? But all of this is not the main point of the letter. This isn't really why Paul is writing it, but it's important enough that it has to be mentioned. Through all the fights and the contention and the problems and the drama, we're still called to be Christ-like. And even though we're going to have disagreements, and we're not always going to get along, and there's going to be personality conflicts, we're still called to live like Christ even though there's some church hurt taking place. That doesn't negate the fact that we're God's family. And I think there's a very important lesson in this for us, because how often do we see someone get hurt by the church, and the result is to abandon it completely? The people in church were mean to me, so I'm just done with it all. I want no part of it. I don't like so-and-so. I don't like that decision that was made, so I'm not giving any more money to them. I'm not going to help them. I'm not going to get involved with them. Following Christ cannot be dependent on how other people treat us. People will hurt us. People will fail us. The church isn't always as good as it should be. Christians don't always live up to the standard. What's any of that have to do with Jesus? That's us, not him. He didn't fail you. He's not the one who hurt you. He died for you. He gave himself up for you. He's not the problem. And this section of the letter kind of demonstrates that. Paul's saying, yeah, we are fighting. You hurt me. There's division. But you made a commitment dedicated your life to something. You've been changed and transformed through Christ, and whatever fight and hurt and division is taking place doesn't change that fact. You're Christ's. You've been transformed by Him. Prove your love. Prove your generosity. Be the example we know you are. 
After this, and through the end of the letter, Paul, he goes back to making his defense. He gets back to the main issue at hand. But right here in the middle, he interrupts himself with a very important question. What's really important? Your beef with me or your commitment to Christ? What's really important? Too often we let obstacles come between us and Christ. And they shouldn't be obstacles. We let other things in the world dictate our relationship with Jesus. Those things are side issues. Those things are personal hang-ups. Those things are nothing more than distractions. If we're going to be the people of Christ, really wants us to be, we've got to understand that. Put those things in their proper perspective and not let the outside things, personal problems, and side issues dictate what sort of life we're going to live. This morning we close with an invitation to come to Christ because that is the most important thing you can do. If you haven't repented of your sins, confessed Him, and been baptized, why not? What's the hang-up? What's distracting? What's the issue? Is it Jesus himself that's stopping you? Or is it something else? I encourage you to see what is most important. Is Christ on the cross for you? It's him taking your sins and paying the price for you. Anything else is not nearly as important as that. If there's any other hang-up, it's not even possible for that. If you have another issue that we can help you with, this invitation is for you as well. Whatever it is, we encourage you. Don't let church hurt. Don't let problems. Don't let side issues. Stop. Do what you need to do. Become like Christ. Please come. Always stand. <clears throat> Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without thee. I'll dare not to make one step alone. I cannot bear the loads of life and hatred. I need thy strength to lead myself.
Precisely. 